Um, so this paper, well, I had some problems to come to terms with it because, uh, well, it, it was a complex discussion uh, with a young philosopher who's Quentin Meyasu. Um, so I already gave two versions of this paper, uh, one in England and the other in the States. But uh, so each time a bit different. Tonight you'll have the definitive version as um, this has um, appeared as a book chapter. My book, which, uh, which just came out in France under the title Before Tomorrow, Epigenesis and Rationality. So this is um, a chapter of that book. And the title is Can We Relinquish the Transcendental? Is contemporary continental European philosophy preparing itself to break with Kant? An attack upon supposedly indestructible structures of knowledge is happening today. Finitude of the subject, phenomenal given a priori synthesis. Relinquishing the transcendental, such as the leading project of post-critical thinking in the early 21st century, as it appears in Quentin Meyasu's book, After Finitude. So that's why I've decided to entitle this talk, uh, Can We Relinquish Transcendental? Um, so I will discuss in that, uh, in my paper, I will discuss After Finitude, and I will discuss the project of abandoning Kant himself and I will ask myself whether it is possible to go on doing continental philosophy, <coughs> European philosophy, as opposed to analytical philosophy, once we've, um, we have uh, um, accomplished this relinquishing. So I'm starting with a quote uh, from Meyasu. The primary condition to the issue I intend to deal with, with here is the relinquishing of transcendentalism. The French expression is l'abandon du transcendental. And I think that, well, the translator uh, goes with the relinquishing of transcendentalism, but I think that it would be better to say the, the relinquishing of the transcendental, because what Meyasu is talking about is le transcendental and not transcendentalism. As for relinquishing, the, the verb relinquish, it implies, I think in English, something softer, gentler than the French abandonner, Abandon. Mm. Abandonment means a definite separation, whereas it seems that relinquishing designates more something like a negotiated rupture, a farewell that maintains a relationship with what it splits from. So whether Meyer Sue's abandon, abandon means relinquishing or abandonment will be examined later. For the moment, I wish to insist upon the fact that he proposes very simply that we leave the transcendental, that philosophy to come in the 21st century has to leave the transcendental and consequently also count behind. So what I intend to question here is this very gesture. Uh, can we relinquish the transcendental and consequently also can we relinquish Kant and Kantian philosophy? The problem is all the more serious if we admit that Kantianism may be considered the very origin, the very foundation of European philosophy. When we say continental tradition, I'm doing continental philosophy, we mean in a way or another, we are heirs of Kant, of Kantianism. So the we, included in the question, can we relinquish the transcendental, addresses all continental philosophers. Its signification then becomes, can we relinquish the transcendental without relinquishing purely and simply continental philosophy, without putting at risk continental philosophy's identity, such is the immense challenge raised by after finitude. And what is all the more interesting in Meyerson's book is that he proposes that challenge of, Kant's, of Kantian philosophy without, without doing con, uh, analytical philosophy. He, he remains uh, within the continental tradition uh, even if he challenges Kant's authority. So first, I will examine the reasons for, for such a challenge. Uh, what are the reasons why he's proposing such um, relinquishing? And uh, so I will lead, 
this will lead me to expose Ms. Sue's main arguments, and then I will discuss them. Because I don't think we can, uh, if you want to hear my conclusion, I don't think this is something we can do. So let me um, uh, recall the very um, obvious definitions of the transcendental, which Kant is giving in the introduction of the critique to the critique of pure reason. Transcendental, Kant says, should be understood both as synonymous to a priori, meaning, I quote, absolutely independent from all experience, and as synonymous to the condition of possibility in general. The a priori possibility of cognition, Kant says, is transcendental. The relinquishing of the transcendental then implies a break with the a priori, with the idea of the condition of possibility, as well as with their circularity. Why should we why should we proceed to such a rupture? Because, as Miyasu argues, this circularity between a priori, a priori and the condition of possibility was never able to entirely hide or veil its lack of foundation. His main argument is that there, cannot, there can be no transcendental deduction of the transcendental. So, he opposes, well, as you know, uh, transcendental deduction is a fundam fundamental moment of the first critique, and Meyesu says this is not a deduction. What Kant calls a priori is just a presupposition. So that, so that what Kant calls deduction is only a description. He simply posits facts, simple facts, and the pure forms of knowledge and thinking, categories, principles, ideas, are just decreed posited, never deduced, or justified. In Kant, Miyasu argues, I quote, it is impossible to derive the forms of thought from a principle or a system capable of endowing them with absolute necessity. These forms constitute a primary fact which is only susceptible to description and not to deduction. And if the realm of the in itself can be distinguished from the phenomenon, this is precisely because of the facticity of these forms, the fact that they can be only described. For if they were de deducible, theirs would be an unconditional necessity that abolishes the possibility of their being and in itself that could differ from them. So again, the argument seems very simple. The transcendental in Kant is a fact. But at that point, um, may assume might encounter an objection. Is it not an old question that he is addressing? How not to object that the bringing to light of such a facticity of the transcendental has already and often been done? Has not the transcendental already been relinquished, criticized, deconstructed in the name of its defective foundations? Examples of such approaches are numerous. I could, of course, immediately mention Hegel, but we can also take three examples very rapidly in 20th century philosophy, before going back to Meissou, Heidegger, Heidegger, Derrida, and Foucault. Heidegger, the vocabulary of the transcendental is still evident in being and time, as well as in the book Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics. The title of Being and Time's first part is The Interpretation of Dasein in Terms of Temporality and the Explication of Time as the Transcendental horizon for the question of being. So according to, well, it, it, at that period, originary temporality is still defined in terms of transcendental temporality. Without entering into the detail of Heidegger's philosophical evolution, I will just mention that soon after being in time, in the basic problems of phenomenology, for example, and later in the contributions to philosophy, Heidegger will never again use the term transcendental, and he will assimilate the a priori to an ontic metaphysical principle, among others. So in his way, Heidegger has already relinquished the transcendental. In Derrida's work, we can isolate three main elaborations of the critique of the transcendental. First, the deconstruction of the Husserlian concept of transcendental vécu developed in voice and phenomenon. Second, 
the critique of the transcendental signified developed in of chromatology, and third, the dismantlement of the notion of system in Gla, where Derrida writes, I quote, it is not always, is it not always an element excluded from the system which assures the system possibility of space? The transcendental has always been strictly a trans-categorical, that which could not be received, formed, and clothed in any category internal to the system, the vomit of the system, end of quote. So what Derrida brings to light here is that the transcendental is in a way that is arbitrarily imposed upon the system as its forms, but which remains itself exterior to the system, alien to it, coming from nowhere. And in a way, we can consider Derrida's work as a deconstruction of the transcendental entirely. As for Foucault, we know how complex his relationship with the transcendental is. While leaving aside for considerations of time the detail of the crucial analyses of archaeology of knowledge, as well as those developed is what is enlightenment, I will just refer to a famous passage from his conversation with Giulio Preti in 1972 called The Question of Culture, the question of culture, and I quote from Foucault. In all of my work, I strive to avoid any reference, any reference to the transcendental understood as a condition of the possibility for any knowledge. When I say that I strive to avoid it, I do not mean that I'm sure of succeeding. I try to historicize to the utmost, to historicize it to the utmost, to leave as little space as possible to the transcendental. I cannot exclude the possibility that one day I will have to confront an irreducible residuum, which will be, in fact, the transcendental. So Foucault very clearly says, I'm doing everything I can to avoid the transcendental. So we see through these three examples, and I could have taken much more in the continental tradition after Kant, we see that, in fact, the break with the transcendental, to use another of Meissou's terms, is not exactly a new and unexpected gesture. Mm, it is already inscribed in what already appears as a tradition. Nevertheless, to come back to the distinction between relinquishing and abandoning, if there's one, I would say, contradicting Meissou's translator a little, that Heidegger, Derrida, and Foucault are relinquishing the transcendental are negotiating the, aban well, the, the um, giving up of the transcendental, whereas it seems that Meyasu definitely, abruptly abandons it. Continental philosophers until now, however violent their reading of Kant, however radical their critique of the transcendental, seem to have always preserved or maintained something of it in the end, even if it's not technically Kantian. Even if they call it, as Derrida, the quasi-transcendental. Because even if transcendental is too metaphysical or technical a term, it nevertheless circumscribes what may be seen as the minimal creed of continental philosophy. And what is it? What do we believe in when we are continental philosophers? We believe in the existence of a set of structures uh, of both theoretical and practical experience that are irreducible to two extremes, to empirical material data on the one hand and to purely formal logic entities or procedures on the other. A set of concepts that allow the real to exist and which could not exist without the real. I think that Foucault uh, gave the most satisfying definition of the transcendental in the archeology span in another article called On the Archeology span of the Sciences. He says, the transcendental is said to be a play of forms that anticipate all contents insofar as they have already rendered them possible. Hmm? So I think this is a very powerful, a very powerful definition of the transcendental. The play of forms that anticipate all contents insofar as they have already, that is a priori, rendered them possible. So, again, the destruction or the critique of the transcendental has until then only been, according to me, a readjustment. 
never quite an abandonment of it. What happens with Meyer Su and speculative realism, this movement called speculative realism in general, and you will have soon Graham Harmon <coughs> coming here to teach, uh, and he's also an, another voice of the speculative realism, even if it, he does that in a different way. What happens to, today with these people, I think is more radical than these destructive, deconstructive, critical re-elaborations of the transcendental. It is something much more abrupt, adamant, dangerous. The idea of an absolute abandonment of the transcendental and of its minimal creed, which we may make even more minimal. There is nothing irreducible. Hmm? We can't believe in something which would be irreducible to the real or to matter. Hmm? There is no irreducible residue. So when Foucault says, perhaps we can't avoid this transcendental residue, Mesu says, of course you can avoid it because there's nothing irreducible. And so you see the problem is how can we remain in the continental, within the continental tradition without positing something irreducible? So what become of us if we break the hold of irreducibility? Of irreducibility? Well, Mesu says, if you break the hold of irreducibility, you will discover that um, until now, philosophy has always been, continental philosophy has only and always been a correlationism. The, world, the word correlationism at work in after finitude has become infamous. So let us try to understand it specifically in the context of the irreducible, which, us which usually defines the transcendental. Meyasu argues that every time we say that, that there's something irreducible, we mean something non-deductible and purely factual. We continental philosophers make the decision that there is something irreducible in thinking which pertains to the a priori synthesis. Every time we say there is something irreducible, we refer to Kant ever if we're not aware of, of it. That is to correlationism, Mesu says. Because what Kant has posited as the irreducible, even if Kant, of course, doesn't use this vocabulary, is the originary synthesis, intrication, correlation between the subject and the object, or the world and the subject, as it appears in the passage from Foucault I just quoted. What we call transcendental is the a priori synthesis between the subject and the object. Even before we are born, we are bound to the world. The subject is attached to the world, and this is what is transcendental. We, we cannot go beyond that. The transcendental is just another name for the correlation, which again is not explicable in terms of materialism or formal logic. By correlation, Meyasu writes, we mean the idea according to which we only have access to the correlation between thinking and being, never to either term considered apart from the other. We will henceforth call correlationism any current of thought which maintains the unsur unsurpassable character of the correlation to be defined. Correlationism consists in disqualifying the claim that it is possible to consider the realms of subjectivity and objectiv objectivity independently of one another. So again, what Kant calls transcendental would be the a priori conjunction correlation between the subject and the world, which for Meyesu is presupposed and never deduced. In a sense, as Meyesu acknowledges it, I quote, we cannot be heirs, we cannot but be heirs to Kantianism, end of quote. There is no question in denying it. Returning to pre-critical pre philosophy or dogmatism would be purely and simply impossible. But what appears as one of the main challenges of our philosophical time is the task to elaborate a genuine post-critical position, which is a non-synthetic position, without without it pertaining to analytical philosophical either. So can we go 
further the synthesis? Can we stop thinking in terms of correlationism without going back to a pretty critical state and without uh, merging with analytical philosophy either? In order to explore in a more detailed way the critique of correlationism, I chose two lines of analysis among the most radical of the book. First, uh, Mesu's critique coincides with an unprecedented movement of dispossession and expropriation of subjectivity. So what does that mean? To, to expel subjectivity from philosophy. And second, it leads to elaborating a new concept of alterity, an alterity other than that of the utterly other. And for me, the book is really powerful because of these two, for, for these two reasons, the ex expelling of subjectivity and the new concept of alterity, which uh, follows from it. So before I, I come to my critique, I would like to uh, praise these two points and, and to expose them for a moment. To relinquish the transcendental imply, implies a neutralization of the proper and of the notion of property. To relinquish the synthesis amounts to admitting that the world is not our world, that the world does not belong to any subject, that the laws of nature are not, contrary to what Kant says, the laws of our understanding, <coughs> that we are not correlated to the world or to nature. Nature does not belong to us. The synthesis, as Kant defines it, is undoubtedly, on the contrary, a mark of property. Let us recall the beginning of the critique of judgment. For example, when Kant distinguishes among a field, a territory, and a domain, and affirms that we have to find in this geography a place where knowledge is possible for us, a place of our own, a quote from Kant. Concepts, so far as they are referred to objects, apart from the question of whether knowledge of them is possible or not, have their field, which is determined simply by the relation in which that object stands to our faculty of cognition in general. The part of this field in which knowledge is possible for us is a territory, and the part of the territory over which they exercise legislative authority is the realm of these concepts and their appropriate cognitive faculty. So the metaphor of the land is very significant here. It conveys the idea of possession, ownership, and mastery. The transcendental is another name of the mastery of the world by our knowledge. And such is the contradiction of Kantianism that it presents itself as a desubstantialization of subjectivity. Subjectivity for Kant is just a form, but at the same time, this confers to the a priori synthesis the status of an ownership. For Kant, there is nothing prior to our relationship to the world. So in that sense, Meersu argues that we have to restitute the world to itself. And consequently also, we have to think its anteriority over the a priori. That's why Meersu proposes to substitute for the term a priori, the term ancestrality, which means a time where we're not, we were not there, a quote from Mesu, I will call ancestral, any reality anterior to the emergence of the human species, or even anterior to every recognized form of life on Earth. A world posited as anterior to the emergence of thought and even of life. Okay, so to relinquish the transcendental would amount to access to that past, which is a past where we were not there, which is a past which is more uh, ancient in a way than the a priori itself. To relinquish the transcendental implies exploring a dimension of speculation that comes prior to any form of judgment, to any form of thought. It implies, I quote Mirsu again, describing a world where humanity is absent, or what he, still, what he calls also a desert, or I quote again, a world crammed with things and events that are not the correlates of any manifestation, a world 
that is not a correlate of a relation to the world, a world anterior to experience. So I'm very interested in that uh, motive because I'm very interested in indifference in general. And of course, and what, it, what Mayasu is describing is a deserted, neutral, dispossessed world which is totally indifferent to the fact of being thought. This indifference is for Mayasu another name for the absolute. For him, absolute means radically separated, absolutus, radically separated from us, a quote, capable of existing without us, whose separateness from thought is such that it presents itself to us as non-relative to us, and hence as capable of existing whether we exist or not. To me, this approach to the absolute indifference of the world is the most radical attempt at dismantling the notion of property. Playing with the difference between the world and the earth, it appears also as the first speculative ecological concept. The earth is a space that is not ours, which is much older than the a priori. So we have, in a way, what Mesu says is we have to think of it, of the world or earth, as they were before our colonization, before our philosophical colonization. And we have to invent a philosophy without private property. And I reach here the second point of my analysis. Remember I said critique of property and a new concept of alterity. So second point, the new concept of alterity. A world capable of existing without us, as we just saw, a world that would be indifferent to the fact of being thought or judged and is consequently also indifferent to its supposed necessity is, a totally, is the possibility of a totally other world. Necessity is just one of our categories. In reality, and this is another argument, this is another of Miasu's argument, the world as it is, is radically contingent. And this radical contingency appears as the absolute other. So contingency is a difficult point uh, in, um, after finitude. This brings us back to Kant. If we read the critique of pure reason, we see that what Kant is fighting against is the idea of a contingency of the world. As you know, he fights with, with Hume about that. What is at stake in the moment of the first critique, which is called transcendental deduction, is the affirmation that there exists an a priori agreement between our concepts and, ob and the objects of experience. If Kant defines the synthesis as really the a priori, it, it is because he wants to show that the correlation is uh, the reason of the necessity of the world. This agreement uh, is another name for correlation or, or synthesis. And this is what in Kant guarantees the universal necessity of nature and consequently also the stability and permanence of natural laws. Kant says the world is necessary because the world is only uh, the, well, the laws of the world are the laws of our understanding. There's a perfect identity between both. So the world is necessary. I quote Mesu for Kant. These are representations of the world were not governed by necessary connections, which he calls the categories, among which is the principle of causality. The world would be nothing but a disordered mass of confused perceptions incapable of yielding the experience of a unified consciousness. End of quote. So against you and skepticism in general, Kant argues that nature cannot change that the laws of nature cannot change for no reason because they are guaranteed by the permanence <coughs> and the stability of our uh, own laws of thought. Again, again, the a priori synthesis is what in Kant guarantees the universal necessity of the order of things, the order of both nature and the world. But the problem, according to Miyasu, is that he is not able to demonstrate this. Such a necessity cannot be deduced in Kant, but only described again. A priori synthesis, in fact, in Kant is never proved. It is never justified. It is imposed. It is what always appears as purely factual. 
there is no necessary demonstration of natural necessity. We just have to take it for granted. When Kant says the world is necessary, we have to take it for granted. How can it be otherwise, Mr. says, to the extent that the basis of transcendental necessity itself, that is correlation, does not have sufficient reason? Facticity, Meyasu writes, just consists in not knowing why the correlational structure has to be thus. No one in continental philosophy will ever be able to justify why we have to start with the correlation between the subject and the object. According to Meyasu, there has never been a justification of that. The relation subject-object is contingent. It has never, never, be, never been pro proved. Contingency alone is necessary, then, Meyasu says. If we cannot prove the necessity of the correlation between the subject and the object, it means that everything is contingent. In that sense, Meyasu argues, I go on with the demonstration, Kant never solved Hume's problem. Skepticism is not overcome, in fact, by criticism. What is Hume's problem? Hume sa says, Hume's problem can be formulated as follows, and you know that. Is it possible, Hume asked, to demonstrate that the same effect will always follow from the same causes? And this question concerns the capacity of physics to demonstrate the necessity of the causal connection and consequently the permanent stability of natural laws. That the world might radically change, that the laws of physics might be totally contingent, that the same effects could not follow from the same causes is the hypothesis that Kant adamantly rejects. Oh, of course, we can prove that the same effects will follow from the same cause because the subject and object are correlated and because we can prove that from this connection. But Mesu says, yes, but you cannot demonstrate it. So because you, you're not able to provide the necessary demonstration of this causality, in fact, the transcendental negatively reveals the very existence of what it disavows, that is skepticism. Its deduction is its destruction. Why not then reveal what Kant is hiding? That is the very problem of continental philosophy since the beginning, which is absolute contingency. That is also absolute otherness. Why do we want to hide skepticism, to hide from, to hide away from skepticism? Why not recognizing as our problem? And what is contingency? What is radical contingency? What is absolute contingency? This is absolute otherness, and this, this is why um, I was announcing that Meyasu is also uh, proposing a new concept of alterity. Contingency, Meyasu writes, I quote, refers back to the Latin contingere, meaning to touch, to befall, which is to say that which happens, but which happens enough to happen to us. The contingent in the world is something that finally happens, some, something other, something which in its irreducibility to all pre-registered possibilities puts an end to the vanity of a game where, wherein everything, even the improbable, is predictable. So to summarize, what is the contingent? The contingent is the radically other. A speculative concept of contingency demands that we radically distinguish between contingency and chance. When Mesu talks about contingency, uh, it's not, uh, it is not chance, which also means that the contingency of natural laws remains, I quote, inaccessible to aleatory reasoning. And what is interesting in Mesu's uh, demonstration is that he's not proposing a return to Hume. He's not saying, oh, Kant has not uh, superseded Hume, so let's go back to Hume. We have also to go beyond Hume to solve Hume's problem because Hume's concept of contingency is too weak because it, it is still linked with the notions of probabilities and chance. 
The famous example of the billiard balls and the rolling of the dice constitute, as we know, the most famous examples of such a link. So why, according to Meyersu, can't probabilities allow us to access the co absolute contingency of the world? We touch here an important point. Because even if the amount of possibilities or probabilities opened by chance is infinite, chance, the concept of chance, does not and will not ever displace the very concept of possibility itself. Our world might have been different and is perhaps just the result of a happy chance. Another world might have been possible, but the concept of possibility itself would remain the same. I could may assume. Chance is not able to modify the meanings of possibility and necessity because it's, it fundamentally depends, depends upon them. The very notion of chance is only conceivable at the condition that there are unalterable physical laws. The notion of chance thus implies that one believes in the fact that possibilities, even if innumerable, form a whole and can be totalized as a numeric entity. So you see, he's not returning to you because you oppose to necessity the contingency of the world in the form of probabilities, in the form of chance, you know, the, the billiard balls and etc., or, or the throwing of the dice. And Mr. says, no, this is not satis satisfactory because it is still too confident in the notion of possibility, and possibility is still a correlationist notion. Mirsu then brings to light a non-probabilistic type of reasoning that allows us to access absolute contingency as also mathematical in nature. And here we see that uh, Mirsu is, is a student of Badiou because they both believe in mathematics as being, as opening the possibility of a new way of thinking the world. And what Mirsu um, uses as um, an argument to reintroduce contingency <coughs> is the notion, mathematical notion of the transfinite. The Cantorian notion of the transfinite corresponds precisely to the impossibility of totalizing the possible. Hmm? Probabilities still are still confident in the totality of possibilities. Hmm? Possibilities are innumerable, but at the same time their number is restricted, is finite, is totalizable. On the contrary, with the transfinite, we have the idea of the impossibility to totalize the possible. I quote this. It is precisely this totalization of the possibilities which can no longer be guaranteed a priori. For we know now, no, we now know, indeed we have known it at last since Cantor's revolutionary set theory, that we have no grounds for maintaining that the conceivable is necessarily totalizable. For one of the fundamental components of this revolution was the de-totalization of number, a de-totalization also known as the transfinite. And here we understand that after finitude means uh, toward the transfinite, not infinity, but the transfinite. That is a way to stop totalizing the possibility. Because this would be what Kant and Hume still share, hmm? that Kant says, Everything is necessary, and this is uh, uh, the condition of possibility for uh, thinking. Hume says, no, everything is contingent, but still we believe in the totality of possibles uh, and possibilities. So that would be still the link between Kant and Hume. We have to um, elaborate on something which would be the impossibility to totalize the possibility. An absolute contingency would thus be associated with the absolute possibility of the non-existence of possibility as such. Contingent is what is not possible. With the idea of, of a world in which possibility and necessity would not mean anything, which would, for that reason, ruin the very notion of probability and chance. So radical contingency must be understood as the deprivation of all physical necessity without conferring to this deprivation the status of a possibility. Okay? The other world is not possible proper. It is contingent. 
Hmm? It may change. It may be other than what it is, but this otherness is not possible. It is something else. It is something which uh, render the very notion of possibility itself contingent. The speculative concept of radical contingency, according to which contingency alone is necessary, brings to light the strong link that binds my first motive, that is dispossession, and the second one, alterity, and mathematics together. Mathematics would, according to Meyasu, but mathematics done in a non-Kantian way, lay bare the ontological principles of a deserted world where humanity is absent, a world, again, crowned with things and events that are not the correlates of any manifestation. Okay? So only mathematics would be able to give us access to a world which is not possible, which is not impossible either, which is just totally contingent, purely contingent, that is, in a way, beyond the possible and the impossible. To attempt to define a new relationship to otherness through mathematics allows us to elaborate a rational concept of it. Thanks to the transfinite, according to Minsu, <coughs> we can access a speculative notion of absolute otherness, which has nothing to do with what, for example, <coughs> Levinas calls the absolute other or the utterly other. Here is the expression of this radical otherness. It is not the utterly other as the face, for example, as Levinas describes it. It is the possibility that, I could Meyasu, everything could actually collapse. From trees to stars, from stars to laws, from physical laws to logical laws, and this not by virtue of some superior law whereby everything is destined to perish, but by virtue of the absence of any superior law capable of preserving anything, no matter what, from perishing. Okay, so the utterly other is the, is the opening of um, the radically other world, which means that our world as it is now may collapse tomorrow and become absolutely utterly other without us being able to think it as a possibility. So to conclude on that concept, I think that Meyesu has touched an important point, which is that until now, all gestures of, of um, abandonment or relinquishing of the transcendental have induced a separation between philosophy and science. For example, when I was talking about the irreducibility, very often in continental philosophy, for us, irreducible means anti-scientific, irreducible to uh, mathematics or, or physical reality. Until then, it seemed that philosophy, continental philosophy has, has ignored and despised the scientific deconstruction of the transcendental and has just maintained the transcendental in poeticizing it. And I think that Meyesu is right to say that this split between philosophy and science urgently has to come to an end that other discourses uh, are pos about otherness and the utterly other are possible uh, than the ethical, non-scientific ones. Nevertheless, uh, and this is what I would briefly uh, like to develop before my conclusion, I'm not really convinced, even if I, I as you can see, I take that very seriously, um, I'm not convinced by the way in which Mesu proposes to overcome the split between philosophy and science. Let me go back to the previous passage about the meaning of contingency. The passage I just quoted uh, when he talk about, talks about contingere. The contingent, in a word, I quote Mesu again, is something that finally happens, something other, something which in its irreducibility to all projects pre-registered possibilities puts an end to the vanity of the game wherein everything, even the improbable, is predictable. Okay, so during all the book, he, in a way, I, I, I'm sure he would not accept that term, but anyway, he, de he deconstructs 
the transcendental, he deconstructs the idea of the necessity of the world, he brings to light this notion of radical contingency. So, in the end, we expect that this other world, this possibility of the totally other world, appears. Hmm? We expect an, explo an explosion, a surprise. What, what is absolute contingency, really? What is this alterity? What does it look like? What world does it create? What is the defeat of finitude? What does the transfinite change to finitude? What metamorphosis? What is happening? And this is the problem. We read the book as a detective story, really. And then, OK, the radical contingency of the world, etc., and that everything can collapse, so we're waiting. We're waiting. And what is happening? And well, one is forced to say nothing. Nothing happens in the end. Even if we, even Within the transfinite theoretical framework, the world remains what it is. The dice of the world remains what it is. And here, according to me, starts the less convincing part of the book, where in the end, Measus tries to prove that contingency, in fact, does not really threaten the world's stability. There is no absolute necessity, but he says there's no Chaos, either, and this is something we've been addressing in class. I quote, our conviction, 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 and here we come to the crux of the matter, is that in order for an entity to be contingent and unnecessary, it cannot be anything whatsoever. Or further, to be is necessarily to be a fact, but to be a fact is not just to be anything whatsoever. <clears throat> I understand that, I could me assume, contingency is such that anything might happen, even nothing at all, so that what is remains as it is, end of quote. Nevertheless, I don't understand the rejection of the anything. Why alterity, if absolute, could not be anything whatsoever? Why can't contingency be assimilated with the anything? He says, the world can collapse, but nevertheless, it cannot be anything whatsoever. Otherwise, my thinking, he says, would be just chaotic. It would just be a thought of the chaos. But my question is, if the world is totally contingent, why can't it become anything? It seems, in the end, that we are... Recon because. Of course, he has a problem. The problem is that the world does not change. It's that every morning the sun rises. Mm? So he says the world can become radically other, but it doesn't. Right? So he has to justify that. You know, at the end of the book, he says, oh, OK, contingency is uh, absolutely open. But then how come that the, the sun is rising every morning? Well, because, uh, because, uh, because the world cannot become anything. Um, so, and this is where I say, no, there's something wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> because you are expecting a kind of explosion and all that. Um, so he says, this is not chance, as it is defined in Hume. This is not the chaos as Nietzsche describes it. So what is it? Is It is some mathematical uh, hypothesis, like the transfinite, but where is the phenomenon? Where is the empirical translation of that, it seems that we are reconducted here to the old split between authenticity and inauthenticity. There would be the good contingency and the inauthentic one, the anything. Mesu, in the end, says that contingency is only thinkable, mathematically possible, but not actual. The contingency of the real is not real. There is no revolution, then, in the end. Everything remains as it is. And of course, in fact, Kant was right. The world is always what it is. The cinnabar is always red. And not any red, but this red. It appears that Miyasu, in the end, wants to conciliate, conciliate the virtuality of a dual change and the constancy and stability of nature. Because again, how can he explain that the world is always what it is? In a very Kantian mode, he preserves the possibility of the world. In a very Kantian mode, he brings to light 
the conditions of possibility for contingency, that is, its transcendental concept. The transcendental difference between what is contingent and what is or can be just anything. For me, if there were, if there were uh, a radical thinking of contingency, then we would have to admit that everything can become anything, hmm? that there's no barrier, um, no guarantee against the anything, against you know, um, the, most, the most totally un irrational, unexpected, monstrous becoming. And this, uh, this is at the same time what Mesu is always escaping from. So, in fact, what I don't understand is that all this demonstration, this brilliant, very, very, very provocative and I think important demonstration uh, against the transcendental, saying that in fact you cannot, you continental philosophers, we continental philosophers, cannot really prove that the world is necessary because uh, this necessity uh, relies on something which is not demonstrated which is the correlation between the subject and the object. And that because we cannot demonstrate that, we have to admit that the world is not ours, and in that sense, that it is totally contingent and that there's nothing we can do against that. This very brilliant demonstration. Also, the, the, the very strong claim that philosophy and mathematics has to be, have to be reconciled, all that, that we have to move to another toward another concept of the other, all that which is very important, and, and the uh, uh, really invigorating uh, challenge uh, of Kantian philosophy, which is, I think, very necessary, because every time that Kant is uh, shaken, I think we gain something. Hmm? Everything that the critique of, every time that the critique of pure reason is challenged, this is a gain for continental philosophy. It started with Hegel, and it comes come to an end, but at the same time, and you understand what my problem is, is that this notion of radical contingency is not, is not really convincing because it has no empirical phenomena and because it, it ends up in drawing a, a frontier between the authentic and the inauthentic. Authentic contingency is the mathematical one, uh, the transfinite, inauthentic is the anything. And I, this is a new uh, frontier, a new partake, which is very close to a transcendental condition of possibility. So in the end, as a conclusion, I will come back to my question. Can we relinquish the transcendental? If transcendental means authentic, then not only can we relinquish the transcendental, but we have to. But it also means then that we also have to relinquish the transfinite, the transfinite, which is of an alterity that is only mathematically possible, as disappears as another form of authenticity and irreducibility. We define it, we definitely have to relinquish the irreducible, okay, this is true. I think that nothing is irreducible, but mathematics are not irreducible either. And we cannot maintain any longer the barrier, the barrier between the authentic and the inauthentic. I do think, and this is why I think that speculative realism is so important, that nothing is irreducible, nothing is authentic or unconditional. And perhaps this is something we have to really be confronted with now, uh, currently, um, when doing continental philosophy. We cannot seek refuge um, behind the irreducible any longer. But we have to be cautious not to reintroduce the irreducible in another way, by, for example, introducing uh, the uh, uh, distinction between authentic contingency, which would be the transfinite, and inauthentic contingency, which would be the anything. Then, can we remain continental philosophers in my logic, if I open the door to the anything, do I remain a continental philosopher? Is it possible to go on doing philosophy as we do it here, for example, 
if we say the distinction between the inauthentic and the authentic has to be deconstructed, there's nothing irreducible. <coughs> it seems that we can. And that the one who says that we can, and this is what I'm trying to demonstrate in the book, is Kant himself. The trajectory of the three critiques coincides with the most radical exposure of the transcendental to its own destruction ever. When Kant deals with the living being in the third critique, in the second part of the critique of the power of judgment, he deals precisely with the non-transcendental, which is something that refuses to be judged or thought, which is self-sufficient, which prevents us to assign a reason to it, and this is the living being. Kant then comes to the conclusion that there are two types of necessities, mechanistic and teleological. In the third critique, Kant undertakes a deconstruction of the transcendental, which pertains to the pluralization of necessity. What does life do to thought? I quote Kant. There are so many modifications of the universal transcendental natural concept left undetermined by the laws given a priori, he says, that we have to invent another type of judgment. So transcendental is modified by nature, by, nat by natural concepts. So life is what decorrelates philosophy and confronts the transcendental to absolute contingency. The third critique may be read as a critique of trans as transcendental contingency. So my last word, will be, we thus have to negotiate the relinquishing of the transcendental with Kant's own struggle with it. Thank you.